Hello, 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 everyone. Thank you very much for coming today. We have a really special speaker. And as you know, the Nest Egg Builder empowers people to build their wealth consistently by working with commercial real estate and construction, which is what Rob is in. I, I have this quote that I thought was very interesting, and it's by author unknown. So I'm going to make up an author after I finish reading it. <laughs> and, <laughs> an arrow can only be shot by pulling it backwards when when life is dragging you back with difficulties, it means it's going to launch you into something great. So just focus and keep aiming. William Tell. <laughs> How's that? Do y'all know who William Tell is, by the way? Anyway, so that's really great. And uh, Rob was kind enough to make sure that he got me a little bit about him. What I really like about Rob is all, all that he's gotten done. He is, a, he's a second generation. So as much as he'd like to say that uh, they've been in business 30 years, he is second generation. So Rob Knight is the CEO of Whitestone Development LLC. Whitestone Development LLC is a Southwest Florida developer and general contractor company specializing in the construction and sale of single family homes, duplexes, and multifamily rentals in the city of Cape Coral and Fort Myer. Whitestone Development members have 30 years of combined real estate experience ranging from developing, managing, and marketing real estate. Whitestone Development team has developed a business model based on efficiency, cost savings, and competitive pricing while maintaining the highest built quality possible. Our company can cut costs sufficiently, significantly, sorry, and reduce the build cycle by 50%. Are you guys paying attention? That's huge, 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 huge. Rob is looking to partner with investors, family offices, and institutions looking to invest in the build to rent space in the Southwest Florida. He's operating in the heart of the best asset class in one of the best real estate markets in the country. And boy, is that so true. Oh my goodness sakes. He's also building, uh, which he might talk a little bit about, is he's building a 40 unit of uh, build to rent, not no short term. Is that short term rentals in the, in the Cape Coral area of Florida. Uh, he's also working on 300 single family development fund, 144 unit garden style apartment and the, oh yes, the Airbnb Marina resort, which is absolutely incredible. And we have that if you want to look at it. So who we have today with us is Rob Knight. Thank you very much, so much for being here, Rob. We are thrilled to have you. And please take it away. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. It's uh, it's always nice to meet investment groups and masterminds and fun stuff like that. And uh, it looks like you've got a really cool group here. Um, I I think it, it's 20 minutes we have, right? To uh, Yep. Then we go to Q&A. Very good. You know what I'll do? Let me just jump in real quick. You talked about our area here. Let me. I'm going to jump in quick and just give you a quick overview of our area. How many people know Cape Coral? All righty. Well, let me uh, <clears throat> let me give you a quick intro just so you can see the um, title of what we're going to be talking about today is how to transition from house flipping to multifamily development. And that's kind of, um, in a nutshell, my my story and what I started off doing. But let me just give you guys a quick view of Cape Coral. We've got 400 miles of canals and waterways. So we've got more waterways in our city than any city in the world, Venice, Italy included. So it's just this amazing labyrinth as you look through the, the city. Um, we've got white sand beaches that surround our city that look a whole lot like the Caribbean. We've got four marinas in town, five golf courses in town. We even catch fish like this in our backyard. 
Uh, amazing. I've literally, I've literally seen dolphins in my backyard, but we hook into some of the most amazing fish. And these are um, two of my boys that, uh, that just have a lot of fun fishing out in the backyard here. Um, this is what our city looked like in 1959. And this is what it's been transformed into today. So 1959, uh, 1957, the Rosen brothers purchased the whole 125 square miles of Cape Coral um for six hundred and seventy eight thousand dollars um you can't get a nice house on the water <laughs> for that anymore but um but they bought the whole 125 square miles and just did an amazing job transforming it into what we have today with cape coral and actually 50 percent of the city is still unbuilt so if you're into building and development like myself this is a paradise it's um if you can't i always tell people if you can't make it here as an entrepreneur you better go become an, an accountant or or something else because this is an entrepreneurial playground. So um, we're in the top 10s, hottest real estate markets in, uh, in the country, top 10 places to invest, top 10 places to own a boat, top 10 places to retire, top 10 most affordable cities in Florida, top 10 fastest growing populations, top 10 fastest job growth, and the top 25 safest um, cities in the United States with 150,000 people or more. So it's it's really just checks the boxes everywhere you go when you look at this whole area. When you're looking to invest in a place, it's always location, location, location. And this one here just, just really does it well. And just in terms of what we're doing right now, um, and why should you listen to me about transitioning from flipping homes to multifamily, well, we've got uh, $217 million worth of projects under management. Um, I'll go through some of the different projects and talk to you a little about those as we go along. But super exciting projects, each one of them really exciting locations. And um, Whitestone is our um, basically what does our single family homes and Vantage Point is developing the, um, the multifamily sites that we have. Um, we are building the single family homes ourselves as a general contractor and with the multifamily um, uh, sites, we're actually outsourcing that to one of the largest um, uh, multifamily general contractors in the area. Mm -hmm. So I started off, you know, in, two, in 2015, we moved uh, to Cape Coral, I had been 20 years overseas and my family and I decided to come back. I was sitting... Um, sitting in Southern Spain and uh, we were watching TV. My eight year old at the time said to me, um, dad, what's uh, the 4th of July? Something on TV had come up with the 4th of July. And I'd realized after being 20 years overseas that um, it was time to come back and teach my kids a little bit about uh, America as well. So, so we moved back and I wanted to come back. I'd, I'd been doing some real estate over there and I've been doing some real estate even during the whole 2008 crash and purchased you know, a bunch of homes in Miami um, so when I came back after being out of the country so long, I just felt like I needed somebody to kind of orient me towards uh, all the things here in America. So I bought a home homevestors franchise. We uh, we flipped uh, 18 houses our first year um, and just got kind of got our feet wet in the whole thing. And but the thing I found out with house flipping was just tons of competition. Um, margins were shrinking back then, and that was in 2015. Um, investors were all overpaying for their deals and, um, and it was just hard to find inventory. And here I am looking around this, this city and I'm, I'm just seeing, uh, just a myriad of thousands of lots that are available. I knew how to take a house from studs all the way through to completion. Let me go through and let's see about building these ground up. So the first year we built two houses, second year we built eight. And we're up, we're up to uh, to as much as 150 at a time, um, and so we we grew that way. Just you know, building the single family houses, it was a really great way to find the ability in real estate investment to scale your investment, and also to move away from all the competition because everybody's perception was, don't get into new con new construction. It's it's super complicated. And I won't, we won't jump into this right now. We could do a whole nother um, session on uh, transitioning from house flipping to new, new, new ground up, new, uh, new home, single family home construction, 
because that's a fantastic transition as well for investors to, to consider. But um, as I look at it, the single family homes are fantastic, but if you want to even scale your business more, to me, jumping into the multifamily um, circle is is the fastest way that I can see to really scale your real estate investment business. And I'm just going to, I'll talk a little bit about some of my experiences, what we did, and we'll go through some of these together. But first, let me just show you the first, one of the first houses we built, there were my contractors had gunshots going on back and forth. I bought this house for $30,000. Um, I just looked at it this morning and it's selling for $265,000 right now. Um, kind of crazy to see what, uh, what the, you know, when you look back at all the houses you flipped and sold, your biggest regret is that you sold any of them. You should have held on to every single house that you ever bought. Um, and so we're doing a whole bunch of, these are our, some of the models that we're building right now for single family home. Construction, we we got four models that we're basically building. We have 13 models, including a, a duplex model as well. We don't build all 13 very often. We, these four here are the core ones that we're normally doing. And those are going to be um, comprised of the four bedroom and three bedroom uh, houses that are most in demand. <clears throat> and so it's pretty cool. You can make six figures building a single family home. But the cool thing is if you do one of these um, these syndications for multifamily, you can get financial freedom in one deal. And I think that's the powerful difference. You know, when I was flipping houses, we would make $30,000 on a house. I know in California, you guys make a whole lot more, I at least when I'm watching the flipping shows. Um, but uh, but here in Florida, we make, we make $30,000, maybe $40,000 on a house flip. When we do a single family home, we can make six figures on one of those. But when you're doing a, a multifamily development and syndicating it, you can um, you can find financial freedom and make millions of dollars. So it's it's the ability to scale and do volume and the amount of time it takes to get one of those deals. When I compare to how much work and effort I spend building all my single family homes, I absolutely love what we're doing with uh, with syndicating these uh, developments. So here's our first one that we did. This is uh, Lake Chadro. We're slated to break ground on this one here in July. Um, it's going to be an 18-month build cycle. We're going to build, stabilize, and then sell. Um, 48 units, waterfront. We're right, right around the corner from a um, $650 million um, development going in. So lots of activity there. I bought this development at 2.75 million. Um, it just appraised at 6.75 million. So one of the cool things that I've discovered in this whole process as you're going through it is that you create massive amounts of equity when you put the vision together for the project. Um, you uh, you you increase the uh, the the value of the of the project exponentially. Um, on the second project that we did, I bought the 144 unit garden style multifamily. I purchased this one at 1.2 million, which is a eight, 8,333 per door, which is very, very inexpensive. I got this one off market and I did this with one of my VAs out of uh, the Philippines. She put the whole thing under contract without me doing anything except hitting a quick DocuSign. Um, that one um, just appraised at 4.5 million. It's in an opportunity zone. Um, so another really cool project. We're hoping in this one here to break ground on that one in September. And then the final one, <clears throat> this is kind of my favorite one, actually. Uh, I don't know if you get the picture of that picture on the top of those white sand beaches, but this is my favorite place in all of Florida. The sand is so white. It looks like it's the Caribbean. The, the water is so turquoise. You can't believe that it's it's real. Um, but we bought six acres right here. And the fun thing on this one right here was is that the developers that had it couldn't think their way through this situation. There was a um, there was an eagle's nest right here. There's all there was also wetlands down here, and there's two zoning codes here. It took me six months to break the code on this one. 
Um, but what I did was I built a small in a small area. I did my blocks right there and I went up high. Which to me was even better. I got better views out over the over this beautiful water, looking out over those nice white sand beaches. Um, and they just wanted to build villas all the way through. So I bought this one here. It was it was sold previously at six point five million. I bought it at two point nine million. Um, and uh, and this one right here, we had a we did this really interesting too because we went in on it. I I negotiated seller financing as well on it. Did some really cool deals, and this one here was just appraised at six point eight million. Um, so every time we're walking in, we're purchasing, and we're we're adding millions to the bottom line by purchasing really well in the beginning. Um, this one's also in an opportunity zone as well. So if you wanted to get into 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 this deal to create some of these kind of developments, what do you do? Well, what my recommendation to you, if you wanted to get in and start your own syndication, would be get onto the MLS, just start looking for vacant land. And my advice is look for vacant land that's entitled, but not permitted. Because if, if you go off and you're going to get something that's going to be agricultural land and you're going to have to get a committee and the local community to agree with the project and you're doing multifamily, at least in Florida, nobody likes to see multifamily coming in. They want to keep everything the same as it was. And we were just having a conversation about that, that nobody wants any new activity there. So I personally don't like to buy not entitled land. And I've bought unentitled land before um, while I was overseas and spent 10 years trying to sort problems and issues. And, um, and I've decided... For me, anyway, my recommendation is is get it entitled so you know you can build the resort you're looking for or the condos you're looking for, um, and then you're just focused on getting the permitting done. Um, your goal is to identify the zoning and then just figure out how many units can you build. I, I recommend downloading the um, the zoning map for the city that you're interested in and start looking through all the different areas there and seeing if you can find vacant land. One of the cool things about land is you know you, we're all struggling to find the deals out there that are already built but there's land everywhere all over the place mm -hmm. so your the competition you have to go find a class sites is not very hard i mean you look at me in the last couple of years i've got three a class sites that anybody would dream to own on the water white sand beaches i got a mini marina component on both of them um, so I can rent out my 12 Marina slips on each site, uh, at al almost a thousand dollars per month. And those were just surprise upsides that I got in the middle of it. You know, just really nice sites that you don't have to sit there and, and cause I know the same things going on in the multifamily. Everyone's overpaying right for, for the sites. When you go in and you're buying, buying vacant land, you can really people people are sitting on vacant land for a while. You can negotiate them down because everybody's afraid to jump into construction again. So use that to your advantage. And even more so right now, while there's a lot of uncertainty, I'm negotiating better deals than I ever have because there's so much uncertainty and fear out there. So I love it. It's um I'm enjoying this whole season here. I want to keep continuing over the next six months to uh to uh, i've got a uh several other sites i'm trying to acquire as well and it's it's a lot of fun so what would i say doing this i would download you can go in and download every piece of vacant land in the city you're looking for there's a number of um of different um websites and and services that you can use then you skip trace them all and what i did is i skip traced and got everybody's phone numbers everybody's addresses everybody's email addresses and everything and I put my um, I put my agents from the Philippines on the phone because I uploaded all that data then into Mojo Dialer and they just start calling these people with all the land, and um, and all of a sudden you start putting deals that are worth multi millions under contract, and somebody else is doing it for you while you're doing something else with VAs, um, and of course connect with the brokers out there. Um, I've never bought from a broker before. Every time I get it, it's either off market or I find it myself, but that's just been my experience. Um, so 
my motto is the profits in the buying, not in the selling. You make your money when you buy the property. That's right. And, and for me, I look at these, I, I'm looking, I got some, some criteria I'm looking for with multifamily. I've got to be buying less than 15,000 and I've got to be buying more than a hundred doors. When I'm buying golf access, I'm targeting less than 85 K per door. And it was single family. I'm looking at less than 18 K per door. And usually I'm way under those when I'm normally, when I'm buying the, the Gulf access, I'm buying sub 65 K. And when I'm buying um, the, my, some of my multifamily, I'm, you know, I'm getting in there at eight K things like that. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm negotiating hard and, um, and I'm, and I'm doing due diligence as well as, as I'm out there. So I, I focus first on your prospecting just finding the land deals. And by the way, just putting some of these under contract, these land deals, you um, you can get these things under contract and, and wholesale these things just like you can wholesale a house and make a whole lot more money on some of these, uh, these kind of wholesale deals. So I'm doing my due diligence. I'm looking at setbacks. I'm looking at the zoning and, and land use. I have a, an environmental guy who works with me on all my um, single family stuff as well. He's on my speed dial because... When you're looking at something, okay, um, I even before I even put a contract out, I have him do a cursory look at it. And so I would say if you do want to get into land development, get an environmental consultant, find out who's the best. And if you can get one who <clears throat> loves the environment, but he's actually pro-business, then you can really win. Because the guy I got, he um, he loves business and he loves the environment. And he um, he walks the line in, the, in a very... Uh, astute manner so we're looking for wetlands we're looking you know any entitlement risk we're looking at utility hookups are those things close by and then we're looking with the architecture just say is it feasible to build what what i want to do so my first things i'm doing is i'm bringing my civil engineer in i'm bringing my environmentalist in and i bring my architect in and typically i'll just do a zoom meeting i'll grab all the data on a, on a site that i'm interested in I'll set up a Zoom with all three of these guys and just let them talk because half the time these guys already know the sites and you can you can gain a ton of experience. You may be nervous jumping into the into these larger deals like this, but you're going to negotiate a really strong due diligence period and you're going to bring in experts from everywhere to help you learn everything you need to learn and make sure that you're you're covering your back. And the key on it all is, is that you just got to get in control of the land. He who controls the land controls the deal. If you want to control deals and you want to control big deals, it's all about getting land under contract that you know is going to be turning into, into gold. Um, you don't need to put large deposits down. Everybody thinks you have to put down big money to get these deals done. Do you know how much I put down on each one of my deals that are, that are here? Ten thousand dollars on each of my deals that I that I've got. They're all 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 of them are going to put multi million dollars in my pocket, and each one of them I got ten thousand dollars down. Um, if he if somebody's asking you for proof of funds, find the find some of these lenders out here who will give you uh, a line of credit letter. I mean, I've got a line of credit letter that says that um, the lenders are willing to give me um, twenty million dollars for the, uh, the acquisition of land. And you throw that right at them and that gives you the, uh, the leverage to be able to get these, uh, these things tied up. But um, so t don't worry about big money. The second thing is, is you wanna negotiate seller financing if you can, because a lot of these guys have been sitting on this land for a while. Land is one of the least liquid things that you can get a hold of until you begin to develop it and bring vision to it. So what I always do is, is I walk in and I always ask for um, seller financing. And on two of my deals, I got seller financing. One of them, I couldn't get seller financing, but I got a lender to come in. And you can even, you can either, even take the land down without a loan because of the seller financing. So what, um, what I did on that one that's got the beautiful white sand beaches I went down with $10,000 down on it after 90 days, which I extended twice because of all the, um, the, uh, the complications. 
um, I had to put $200,000 down and then another $700,000 60 days after that. And the rest, when the permit got finished. So if you can, if you can do that, what happens is, is you get your $10,000 down and then you go off and you start your, you start doing your capital raising guys. You all know what that is. I mean, uh, you've had how many capital raisers on your show here? So put your 10 K down, start capital raising, and then start creating the vision for it. On that one with the beautiful white sand beaches, we actually went out and got, um, we did some promissory notes with my partner. Um, and um, on that one right there, my partner, actually, we we came in, he put in a million dollars. <throat> but because we started working on the permitting and the vision of it all right away, it ended up getting appraised at 6.8 million. So we didn't even need to finish paying the money in the end because we got a lender six months later to come in and help us refinance out. And so the um, the final payments for the land were covered by the, uh, the bridge loan that I got because we'd created so much value in the land. So you create equity and leverage in your deal you refinance out and you don't even have to pay the final seller financing payments that you've agreed to with your developer. So it's about getting started as fast as you can to start creating equity and then leveraging what the banks will give you to um, to get through it without putting too much money to, into, the, into the deal. Um, you can typically get a 65 up to 80% um, loan on land if you want to go in and acquire it. So maybe you didn't do the, the seller financing, but you just want to go right in. You you can get anywhere between 65 and 80% acquisition on the land. And then you're, what you're going to do is you're going to need to get enough money, three, $400,000 in addition to get through permitting because all your engineers and everybody else to get your, your project all the way through permitting, you're, you're going to need that as well. Um, but before you even finish, most of them, the the, um, the fees you're going to pay for the permitting as well, or they're more back ended. So you, it's probable you're going to be able to refinance out before that. Um, what I would say is make sure when you're when you're in it, if you don't have a ton of money, your capital yourself, bring in some co GPs who have deep pockets, and um, and just don't be afraid to give away um, don't be afraid to give away some equity. Because you can walk in and do some amazing deals that you would never do, but you're going to have to give away some equity in the process. So <clears throat> here's some of the lenders you're going to need, the types of lenders. You're going to need your senior debt lenders for doing the construction. You're going to need your land, land acquisition entitlement lenders. You're going to need that bridge um, financing lender. And we've also used promissory notes. And we've used promissory notes in, in first um, position and second position as well. And um, so that's it. Maybe you get with you get part of the way there with the um, with your land and acquisitions lender, but you need a little bit more. The promissory note with a higher percentage of interest is a nice feature that you can add to what you're doing to get the the rest of the money you need to get your deal done. And this one right here is kind of my model for everything that we we need to uh what how do you build a team that's going to get this big project done and if you walk in and you're smart about how you do it and you build the right kind of team you can walk in even if it's your your first time doing a deal like I'm right now these are my first three big deals that I've done but what I've done is I've surrounded myself with a class people I've got an award-winning architect. I've got an award-winning civil engineer. I got the top one of the top three multifamily GCs in the area. I'm working with for property management on the um, Airbnb side, the largest uh, operator in town. I got a permitting specialist who she's signed off on every single permit in town for the last six years. She knows everybody up to the mayor. Uh, I'm hiring an owner's rep right now who's um, who's finished literally billion, billion multi-billion dollar projects um, who's going to be managing the, managing my projects for me. We've got a really good asset manager in place. 
I've got a great syndication lawyer. Um, I told you about my environmental consultant. Oops. Did we go over in 20 minutes or did I just hit something by mistake there? Anyway, um, so, so yeah, so in, in that as well, you need, you're going to need at least one guy who's got deep pockets, somebody who's got 10% um, liquid of the, of whatever the project cost is going to be. And their net worth is need is going to need to be equal to the amount of the project. So I, I suggest finding some of those deep pocket guys to bring into your, um, sometimes I give these guys, um, sometimes they invest money themselves. Sometimes I just give them a slice for, uh, for being the deep pocket guys in there. And I, and I also bring people in for experience and I bring in the guys who have the capital. I hire a VA to just track, track the progress of all of these projects moving through permitting. I put things into syndication pro so that we can track the investment capital coming into the deals. Um, we've got a bookkeeper and a, and a, a construction contract lawyer. So that's kind of my team that, that I've put together. And by the time I get done, when I I've had some, um, some lenders say to me, okay, how many of these have you actually finished? And I tell them, look, I've built hundreds of single family homes. Okay. And, um, I said, but let me just tell you about my team. And by the time I get done telling them by the, the tell them about the team I put together, they all say, wow, that's great. And I've not had any kind of um, objections on that. So I, I just say that to say that some people will say, well, how do I ever get into this? I'm not, I'm not a builder. I'm not this, I'm not that. It's about knowing who to put around you and the team and then being willing to give away some, uh, some additional equity so that you've got an A team that surrounded you. So while you're on this page, I have a question. It's a money question. So you yep. have hired all these people. How many of them are hired and how, or which ones are hired and which ones get equity? Okay. Um, architects, you know, obviously it's consulting basis, engineer. It's, it's all you get, you're going to, when you're raising your capital, you're going to pull aside the money you need to pay those guys. Um, none of these guys are employed by me. No, so do, do uh, they get equity? If they're not employed by you, do they get equity? No, no. The only ones I give equity to are my GP, co-GP partners. The um, the deep pocket GP partner comes in with um, with the substantial net worth. The one who comes in and, and puts cash down with me on the deal, mm -hmm. those guys get equity. I'll give a slice of equity to somebody who's got experience if he's got thousands of doors of just what I'm trying to build or he's built. The other thing, let me throw this out here too, guys. Um, I've talked my general contractor, my multifamily general contractor into being a, being on the GP side um, and investing with us as well on my projects. And it's pretty cool because now at that point, if they say who, who in your, in your project um, has experience building, if you, if you chose the right general contractor doing multifamily, They've got more experience than um, than anybody out there. So not only do you got a award winning architect, and there's a cool thing for these guys when they do it. You know why it's so attractive to them? They they're able to take the money you were going to give them in fees, and what they'll do is they'll lower the price of the cost of the build, and then they'll take equity instead. And then on top of that, they get to get cost segregation which in our situation is about a hundred percent on each of these projects. So they get big tax write-offs. They get to hold equity and build without having to pay any taxes at all. So it's a really big benefit for a general contractor to come in with and, and make sure your lawyer is smart because there's some, there's some legality issues and, and conflict of interest issues that you have to watch out for, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, but there's a benefit on that as well that you can you can potentially pull if your general contractor is interested in doing that. So who do I give who do I give equity to? Um, my deep pocket GP, the experienced guy in who's a GP, um, the guy who's bringing the capital. Those are the ones that I'm giving a, um, a slice of equity away to. Um, nobody else. Okay. 
Yep. Thank you. Nice to meet. Go ahead. Anyone, anyone else have any questions? Well, I have a lot of questions, but I'm waiting for you to finish your presentation. That's it right there. I'll leave okay. this up in case there's more questions from this as well. Yeah, does anybody have any questions from this page? Yeah, I do. Okay, ask. So how do you find these people? <laughs> good question, good question. Um, the first thing you wanna start off with is your architect. Why? You always wanna to say to yourself, what's the motivation um, for an architect? He wants to keep doing new deals. So he's incentivized to connect you with everybody else. So I would spend my first time, and I, I did this as well when I did single family construction. I got my architect slash draftsman in place first, and he knows everybody. He can refer you to the general contractor, to the civil engineer, to the environmentalist, to everybody. So you're going to get a big chunk of your team right from there. Um I personally, from my masterminds, I, um, I I go out to the different people I know. Um, my syndication lawyer came from Eddie Wilson's whole sphere of uh, of people that um, that's out there. Um, same thing with my asset manager came from uh, some of Eddie Wilson's mastermind groups. My um, my VA, you know the the VAs. I, I don't know what you guys think about the Philippines, but I think the Philippines is freaking amazing, really amazing. Um, we've got six people right now that we employ from the Philippines. Um, and I use, I use E, let me see if I can find the thing. I can, I'll send it to you guys. There's a, there's a website out there that I've, um, I've never found anything like it that's been even close and you hire these people for, you know, $800 a month and you've got people with master's degree and it's just absolutely amazing. It's called evirtualassistance.com. So I, I use that and then I use another piece of software that actually forces them to do a video interview because the problem I have is that you can go through and spend a lot of time interviewing people only to find bad English. And the video, the video interviewing actually filters these people out so fast for you. I use when I hire people in the States, I use um, wise hire, but when I'm hiring a VA and wise hire is awesome because it does personality profiles for you and everything. And, and like, I've got 500 construction managers on wise hire right now. And I just opened up when I'm looking to get my owner's rep and I don't know how many I've got already, but I bet you I've got 50 to 70 already. Um, really good resource. So Wise Hire is another one, another great one for you for that. But, yep. Does that answer your question, Patricia? That question, I'm sorry, another one. I'm sorry, um, can you speak up? I'll try. There you are, we could hear you now. Okay. Um. So the project that I'm currently working on is more of a distressed property. I don't think it needs an architect. What would my next step as far as finding these people be? Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, well, let's look. You don't need the architect. You don't need the civil engineer. Um, you're going to need a general contractor. Um, do, you, do you already have a general contractor that you work with? I, I know. This will be my first project. Um, I'm also in a rural area, so there's not a huge selection of people locally. I'm I'm glad to send you a syndication lawyer. I spent I want to say fifteen thousand to do my uh, PPM agreements and and um, operating agreements and so forth, which is I pretty pretty good. I had another one that charged me twenty five, um, but um, yeah, this guy's this guy Nick Moore. He's 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 really good. He's out of Atlanta. And um, he comes through Eddie's group as well. So I would I would definitely highly recommend that. I would say that um, consider using Syndication Pro platform. Because Syndication Pro, it's pretty cool in that, um, let me just show you really fast.
what do you guys use right now when you're when you're kind of tracking with your investors? Do you have any kind of platform you're using? Um, I'm I, I haven't done any invest uh, set up yet, but um, I've been hanging out with um, Brad Blazer's group, and they use Veravend, I think it is. Okay, okay. Um, this one right here, Syndication Pro, you just, you can load in all of your information. Um, and it's just, it starts tracking a lot, all your investors inside of here. You can do your communication through it there. Um, and then if you want to do like a link, like I have my website here, BPI Florida, if I want to look at the developments and I want to go into a development, it's um it will take me oh it won't let me do it right here because i'm at the dashboard here it, it'll, it'll take me right over to see the um the project and um i can do i, I won't take the time to do it but uh, but basically the offering details it will just take me right over to see and seeing the offering and and uh and what's inside of it and all the video you know the let me see if i can do this and another one Anyway, it's a really great platform for um, for raising capital and organizing all of your data in there. So I would definitely recommend uh, Syndication Pro as okay. one uh, one thing to do. For me, the VA piece of it ha has been, I can't tell you how important because uh, especially if you're doing multiple projects and you're having to track all of the different things and hold everybody accountable, you really need somebody like I, the, um, I, you know, what I pay around um, 1200 a month for my VA right now. And um, she just tracks everything and is, is working really, really hard. She makes sure everybody's on staying on track. And you can ask Peggy if uh, she keeps up with her on stuff. She just does it. She does a really good, a really good job. And I couldn't imagine trying to track all the details of the permitting process without that. And it'll be the same for you if you're doing the construction and rehab process. Um, I don't know what you're thinking about using for, um, you may want to consider Builder Trend for your software for doing the construction. We use Procore, um, but it's a beast. I would, uh, if you're just starting off, I would highly um, recommend um yeah, I, I wouldn't go all the way up to Procore. Builder Trend is going to be is going to be more more uh, reasonable for you. Um, yeah. Any other questions? I think we're you're muted on there, Peggy. Yeah, could you stop sharing? And I have yep. a couple of questions. I want to see if anybody else has some questions. Ready. Anybody put anything in the chat? You know, all those little things. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions for Rob? Thank you all for being here. Chris is here. How great. I was curious about your... So you do sell a carry back. Do you ever ask them if they want to be a JV with you or do you not want JVs um, instead of a carry back? Most of the ones I've talked with right now, they, they have not been interested in that. They just wanted out. Um, but I would, I wouldn't have any problem with doing a JV. Um, I just think sometimes you get a better, you can get a better deal or maybe, you, maybe you could negotiate a better deal with a JV as well. I, um, I, it would depend on the person <clears throat> and how they value it. Yeah, because you know, that one that you had, they wanted to come in and build something, they couldn't figure it out, but you did figure it out. So why would they stay in and be a JV with you? You know, they 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 were, I think they were so frustrated with that Eagle on there. And um, initially I was under contract at 3.75 million and I pulled them down to the 2.9 just because of the complexities as we were going through everything. Mm -hmm. I negotiated them down in that. Um so yeah, and sometimes I think when you're negotiating people down hard, um, it's um, it's harder to say let's be partners in JVs as well. Yeah, that that would be understandable for sure. Yeah, and they might still have doubt about whether you could get the project done. So right. what, 
so you said also about you're creating equity by when you bought, so you buy this property at the price you buy it. And then what have you done to create the equity that now it comes in like at a 6.5 mil? It's, you know what, it's the permitting. It's the permitting. It's the um, environmentals. The, the well, the yeah, there's a ton of stuff. All of the things that you do, whether it's the environmentals and the surveys and the engineering and the the mock-ups and the renderings and the the whole vision of the project and the financials and it's um it's a business at that point, right? That just needs to go under construction. So, um, getting a getting that project to be permit ready shoots the uh, the value of it up like crazy. And you have to spend money to get there. You do. You're gonna have not a ton though. When you think about it, you're you're only spending three to four hundred thousand dollars, but you're making millions in equity. And the cool thing on that is, is that it means that you as GPs don't have to raise as much money in LP um, capital raising. So right. that's a cool part about it. That is a totally cool part about it. Yeah, because that first initial is can be sometimes challenging. Okay, so, today, so right? when you did that, you've got that 48 unit, uh, the sad, sad row. So you have, what did you have to go through to make that into a marina? And that do you own the marina or do you just own the rights? Or because marina, that water and all of that, isn't that owned by the county or the state? Um, no, the, your, the marina, you own that yourself. Um and and we did a marina on both projects, and um, it was a it was a mixed use waterfront on both projects. I've had to, I've had to work with a marina consultant, so that would probably if I'm, on my little chart over there. I probably should add marina consultant as well. Um, and we've had to kind of fight our way through because some of the environmentalists we have the uh, manatee protection group that um, is difficult to deal with. But um, he's been able to effectively um, persuade and show these guys their own laws, what they and, and interpret them the, the right way, and give us the maximum number of of slips out there. And and you get a thousand dollars a month for a slip. It's you know Peggy, it's crazy because it cost me about twenty thousand dollars to build these. A slip for us, yeah, for the for the boat lifts, and um, and. And then I can I can rent them out for so much. I mean, in a year and a half, I can have these things paid off, and it's just pure cash flow after that. You know, twelve that's twelve thousand dollars of of monthly cash flow just for the just for the marina piece. And on on Turquoise Bay, I um I didn't even realize I was going to get to do the um the mini marina on that one, but we're uh, we're doing twelve boat lifts on that one as well. So when you say boat lifts, does that mean they have to come out of the water? Yeah, the way it works here is um, you you drive your boat up and a lift pulls the boat out of the water so that you don't have all the growth of the um, seaweed and different uh, um, things that will end up growing in the bottom of the boat. Uh, and then it still and it hangs there. It just hangs right there, yeah. Oh, okay. It hangs there in the air. Uh, all right. So, yeah, you just keep it out of the water. You keep it okay. out of the water. I didn't know that. That's very yep. interesting. And then you... Press a button when you want to go back out, and it goes down into the water, and away you go. And as uh, so here, and we have a place called Venice, also in California, and they now have it locked off, so nobody can get in except the people that own boats. Now, do you have to do anything like that, or is it pretty open? No, it's wide open, wide open. Okay, just always curious. Yeah, no, we have restaurants all over the place here on the water, and you can drive your boat to go have dinner if you want and things like that. So do you keep extra uh, places for them to park while they're having dinner? Yep. yep. So you have you have guest parking, and then do they have to pay for that, or is that just part of your HOA fees? Um, No, the guest parking, they just, people just come in and, uh, and park there. I mean, maybe some places would charge, but everywhere I've gone, you know, you just kind of park your boat, have have dinner and take off okay just curious and um and one of your slides you had something about political entitlement risk so what what is what is political 
Entitlement. Yes. Risk. Yeah, that was where I was saying for me, I would avoid going in and getting something that isn't already entitled, right? Yep. Um, because you can you can make a lot of money if you go in and buy agricultural land, and then you go in and, and convince the the area and the city and uh, in the county to let you do one of those multifamily developments. You're buying it at a fraction of the cost, but you're running the risk that everybody starts to blockade you and come up to the um, committee meetings and just say, you know, we don't want this development. And then all of a sudden your, uh, your investor money's at risk for me. I don't want to get anywhere near one of those back into agriculture. But yeah. Yeah. So I, I say, stay away from it. Make sure it's entitled for whatever you, whatever use you're looking for, and then just focus on getting it permitted and creating that equity. Okay. That's really great. Did anybody have, did I create any curiosity to create more questions? Anyone? Well, if anybody's, oh, is that your hand going up, Ted? What's the weather risk in your geography? Mm. Good question. We do have risks here. About every 10 years, we get a real rough hurricane. Um, we had one that, uh, you know, came through a few years ago, Hurricane Ian, and it was one of those one in a 500 year, you know, occurrence. Now, one of the things I've done on my um, developments, um, number one, like on we're, we're the one that has those nice beaches and everything, our finished floor is 11 feet above sea, sea level. So it's up pretty high. We're built on building on stilts. So the risk of Flooding, which is the big risk here in the, in the area, is very minimal. When you most times the wind damage is just going to take some shingles off and some things like that on homes. But like some some of the houses, if they were built in the sixties and seventies, they were built at a finished floor that was a lot lower. Every every time there's a hurricane, they raise the um, the the height of our finished floor that we build at. So I had over a hundred houses in the ground at the time when we were um, we had Hurricane Ian come through, and there was a there was quite a bit of flooding in the area. Not one of my houses had any flooding, including the ones that were waterfront. Um, and the the fun thing I'm doing on my projects actually because we build up so high um, that essentially every everything you build is out of the flood zone now, and so I actually found a way for fourteen thousand dollars to carve my whole project out of the flood zone and ended up being able to save at Lake Shad Row. I'm estimating about $200,000 a year just in, um, in expenses that I would have paid for flood insurance if I hadn't done that. Wow. Congratulations. So, yeah. A little bit more, um, a little bit more money in the, into our investors pockets and not, uh, and not the insurance companies. Well, that'll make them all happy. David. Yeah, hey Peggy. Yeah, I do have some questions. Um I I'm I kind of come came into your uh meeting a little later. Um, but what what is the mo uh the asset class that you're finding has the most demand? And I'm just curious with with the other other properties you have with demand with the insurance in Florida and so forth, what what are the pushbacks or you know, that those kind of things? There is a little bit of pushback right now in terms of insurance. The fact that I've figured out how to carve my myself out of the flood zone helps me answer that um, to a good degree. Um, and, you know, there's new new insurance companies coming in that are pulling the rates back down little by little as well. And this, it's a pretty common thing that happens. In terms of which asset class I find is the most in demand, I find it's different depending on who you talk with. I find the lenders find it most and also the investors i should say find that straight multifamily garden style multifamily is easiest to understand but i find that the amount of equity i'm creating on the waterfront projects and the versatility to either condo it out or sell it off as uh to institutional airbnb investors um that flexibility is pretty powerful and the just the appraised value alone um, like I know if I build a single family home here right now on a dry lot, um, and then I refinance, most of the investors have been getting their money back and burring out when we're doing it on saltwater and waterfront properties, 
they're getting six figures back from the bank and their money back. So there's something pretty powerful about getting those kind of waterfront locations. I also find right now that the Airbnb, because the um, interest rates are chewing up a lot of um, our, of our profits and cash flow on just the standard multifamily stuff, that the attractiveness of the returns that I have on my pro formas for my waterfront sites is more attractive and it looks looks a lot better. So I think the um, the ability to have higher cash flow through those kind of assets, and we've purpose built these assets as an Airbnb asset. So we've put in all kinds of different um, amenities that we know are going to give us the highest occupancy rates. When you see um, Airbnb assets that have really good amenities, they um, they get much higher occupancy rates and they're just shoot off the charts in terms of their returns. I think we're going to be able to do that as well because we have built into the project some really nice amenity mix into uh, into what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. You mentioned uh, the project that you're doing on the waterfront and, and uh, a no flood zone. That that's a flood zone location. So I'm yeah. curious on that. And also, are you building and finding any interest with Wall Street of of re, uh, reselling to Wall Street? Yeah. No. The um, I'm in I'm in contact with a whole bunch of um, institutional investors. In fact. The, I started off with these waterfront sites because I was off at some Airbnb masterminds and some of the institutional Wall Street investment groups were there saying, we want to invest in Airbnb. We like the additional revenue that um, it provides at this time, but we're having a hard time aggregating enough Airbnb assets in one area to make it make sense for us. And um, so purpose building 48 units on the water or 43 units on the water puts them there for the Wall Street investment groups that are that are looking uh, to buy these assets. I thought that was a brilliant idea. Yeah, Anything just else, listen to David? people complain. Anything else, David? No, that's it. Thank you. Okay, great. So if I just sent out to everyone a couple days ago, the list and Shadrow is on that. If you have any interest in Shadrow, which is the 48 unit, please let me know. And any of the others, if you have interest in Rob's developments that he has upcoming, let me know and we will get that information to you also. Yep. So it's a, a, we love that we love the 48 unit. We think that's a brilliant idea to put 48. Plus, it's multifamily. It's not just the 48 units. It's also the multifamily. Plus, it's the marina. So there's just all kinds of different income coming from that. Not only that, I bet maybe if you have a different conversation with Rob, if you wanted to own one of those, maybe you could. Maybe. Maybe not. Depends yeah. on whether Wall Street jumps in or not. Right. Yeah. No, the other option is if Wall Street doesn't jump in, we condo it all out and just sell each of the condos out. So you're right. Yep. Right. And then they can each run them as a, as a short term rentals. So great. I, personally, I like that approach myself a little bit better. I'm going to I'm going to do what's highest and best for our investors, but I would rather just own these and never sell them because the, the, the locations are so amazing. Amazing. Plus you have all that additional, and I presume that a restaurant will be part of the mixed use. There is, there's a nice waterfront restaurant. We've got 15,000 square foot of triple net commercial as well. Um, so we've got, a, we've got a, um, a lot of commercial units to sell as well. That's great. So we are at the top of the hour and Rob, I want to thank you very much for coming on and sharing this with everyone. And I love the education about, uh, becoming a becoming a developer rather than uh, a flipper. So thanks very much for that. <laughs> it's been really great. I agree. I think it's great to have. I love that you have this whole team all set up, ready to go, and you just oversee that and you've got your and you've got a lot of automation put in place. I think that's really important and that keeps your profitability high also. So thank you and we hope you come back again. Thank you. Appreciate hanging out with you guys. Have a good day. If anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me.